the other side of midnight.com. Tune in to listen to Richard C. Hogland and his fascinating guests. Support the broadcast and don't miss another groundbreaking conversation. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive member benefits. Listen to past episodes anytime on any device. Search the archives of over 180 episodes. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side of midnight.com. The other side of midnight.com. Talk radio with pictures on demand. Liberate your hyperdimensional time scale and non linearly access over 400 hours of conversation at the cutting edge of science and thought. Join Club 19.5 Time Schedule Filter episodes by guest or subject. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Talk radio with pictures on demand. The other side of midnight.com. Welcome back to the other side of midnight. Your host for tonight is Keith Morgan, that's me, and Kinthea. And our guest is Gerald Eastwood. And we're also going to have uh, Robert Morningstar on with us in, in a minute. And he's got some interesting stuff about the Kennedy assassination to contribute. So let's get right to them and see exactly what we've got to. to see what's coming up okay guys uh, hello hi Robert how are you I'm fine thank you so we were talking about the Kennedy assassination and I hear you have some interesting information oh, sure the uh, UFO issue is a key element in the assassination of President Kennedy and it actually goes back to the Roswell recovery the army International, uh, excuse me, Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit report cites the fact that, pre that uh, future President Kennedy, when he was a congressman, learned of the Roswell report within days of it happening. And he was briefed by a congressman who was associated with a uh, staff member of the Secretary of the Air Force. The Secretary of the Air Force in 1947 was Stuart Symington, the uncle of five Symington governor of Arizona when the Phoenix Lights uh, occurred. Now, I met Five Symington in Washington, D.C. at the press conference at the National Press Club when Leslie Keene brought out her book, UFOs, Pilots, Officers, and Government Officials uh, Speak Out. I also met the pilot of the F-4, General Parvez Jafari, in the Iranian incident. And uh, another pilot who chased a UFO and shot it, uh, shot at it uh, in um, Ecuador, and had to had the hell scared scared out of himself. He emptied his rockets and he emptied his uh, his uh, cannons into the UFO, and he just saw the um, the ordnance uh, just bouncing off. He chased the UFO to 50,000 feet, and then was running out of fuel. Did nothing to the UFO. Then he turned around. The UFO followed him back all the way to the base, and he was sweating bullets all the way to the base, 
thinking the UFO was going to do to him what he had tried to do to the UFO. Now, General Parvez uh, Jafari, he did chase this. I mean, he was one of two F-4s that was sent out, and the same thing happened to both of them. Their radio communications was knocked out, and their missile um, ordinance was also disabled. Now, he didn't get to fire. He didn't get to fire the missile. He just thought about firing the missile and started to engage. And he said that his cockpit just turned into flames. He just had an overwhelming sense of heat suffusing the uh, cockpit. He did see the white light leave the diamond-shaped UFO with uh, radiant multicolored lights uh, issuing it. And then he saw the what he thought was a missile. He saw the white UFO return. Now, here's the interesting part of the story. I've investigated UFOs across the United States, across the world, Canada, England, and Germany. And when I was in England, I picked up a, a book that related a story about a British doctor and an Iranian who made a pilgrimage to a mountain outside uh, Tehran where pilgrims go to visit uh, the shrine of a, a Muslim saint. And the government puts up shacks, or, uh, cabins up there for the pilgrims can go there. They went up there, and they were in the cabin, dead of night. They heard noises. The door opened, and eight figures clad in black with big black almond-shaped eyes with their, the, the cloaks up to their, up to their noses came in, they just looked at them, and they said, it wasn't a word spoken, but they knew they were told to walk out and follow these men. They followed the men out into the darkness. They could hear rocks and brambles and, and sticks breaking under their feet, and all of a sudden they felt like they were, were walking on a Persian rug. They then went into a room with a big bay window, and they saw the land fall away from them. They claim to have been taken to Greece, Yugoslavia, they saw Paris, they saw London, and then they were taken back. And when they woke up, they were lying on the road at the base of the mountain. The car that had been parked up the mountain was now on the road. They were dazed. They got into the car, started driving back into Tehran. They thought this was the same night. When they turned on the radio, they heard the report about the UFO and they realized it was two days later. It's very similar to the Travis Walton abduction with missing time. So I related this story to General uh, Jafari, and when he heard it, he lit up and he said, you know, I didn't say this in the conference, but the next day I got a helicopter and I flew to the place where I saw the, the UFO land on the desert floor. I followed it down and I could see it landed and rainbow colored lights were radiating. It was illuminating the whole desert floor. And it was in this village where you told me, where you say this happened. So you had an alien abduction of two uh, professionals, an Iranian and a British doctor. Then they took them for two days. They dropped them in the same place, at the base of the mountain. And General Jafari was able to confirm that that was the place where he saw the UFO light. So that's a that's a very big story. I also have that uh, told in my YouTube channel. I did a, a, a program on this abduction. Also, Iran is the only country that has openly acknowledged UFOs actually for four years because President Rouhani, when he was a young boy in grammar school, was on his way to grammar school and he saw a UFO hovering over a mosque. So he cut school and he chased this UFO all over Tehran, and each time it went over and hovered near a mosque, and at one point it landed. But he said it was not a disc-shaped flying saucer. He said that it looked rectangular, and he made the uh, comparison with the saddles that they put on elephants in India. And now this coincides with the so-called diamond-shaped UFO that was seen over Tehran. With regard to President Kennedy, let me go back to him. The U.S. Army put him on a watch list. He is item 10 in the IPU report. And it says, we've learned that Congressman John F. Kennedy, Democrat of Massachusetts, son of Joseph P. Kennedy, member of the President's 
committee to reorganize the government learned of these uh, affairs on a flight from Boston to Washington, and he learned it from the staff member. Now, that was Symington. Now, let me go to Five Simon. I went over to Five Symington and I said to him, Symington, you know, that, that was, are you the son of Stuart Symington? He said, no, I'm the nephew, he's my uncle. Now, Five Symington also served in the U.S. Air Force. So we started talking about the Phoenix Lights. And he said, Robert, I saw it. He said, Robert, you, you're from New York. You know how wide a New, Sunday New York Times is, those two pages? Imagine opening up the New York Times to full width, holding that newspaper over your head. I did that. And the tips, the wingtips of this boomerang-shaped UFO extended beyond. That's how big it was. So this thing was huge. Going back to President Kennedy's death, President Kennedy on November 12th exchanged a hotline message with Nikita Khrushchev. He called on Khrushchev to share details of their UFO research with us because President Kennedy and Premier Nikita Khrushchev were afraid, and rightly so, that a certain faction of UFOs, there were several groups of aliens visiting the planet, two of them are hostile. And they felt that this hostile group was trying to lure the United States and Russia into a nuclear war by pretending to be incoming nuclear missiles. The fast walkers, these are the, this is the term that the Air Force gave them. UFOs would come over the North Pole and start streaking down over Canada. They were picked up by the Dew Line and Demuse Line. Dew Line delayed early warning system, Demuse ballistic missile early warning system. And then they'd be coming over Canada, heading for our major cities, and it would it would just drive Cheyenne Mountain crazy. They'd go to DEFCON 2 and then DEFCON 1 and ready to launch a counter-strike. And then they'd stop, dead stop in the air and go vertical, straight up and disappear. Now this was happening to Russia and it was happening to us. And President Kennedy's first UFO crisis happened 12 days after he was inaugurated and Robert Dean, to whom Kinthea referred, told the story. He was, he was in NATO and he had a cosmic top secret clearance. And on February 12th, a huge fleet of UFOs overflew Eastern Europe, crossed over Germany, crossed over France, which was part of NATO at that time, crossed over England, turned north, went over the North Sea, turned back to the east, flew over the Scandinavian countries, went back to Russia. And President Kennedy was alerted to that. And they thought that that was a bomber, um, a bomber fleet from Russia that was going to do a nuclear attack. So this was the main problem. In the same letter exchanged with Khrushchev, he called on Khrushchev for mutual cooperation in science and for a joint venture to the moon. And President Kennedy issued a directive to the CIA and all the services, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, the CIA itself, and he wanted a list of all black projects on his desk by February 1964 because he was going to tell the American people the truth of the alien presence on our planet. Um, and President Kennedy was not shot by the driver my main, main claim to fame, my first one was proving that the Zapruder film is an optical illusion, a consciously engineered MK Ultra mass hallucination. And at the point where the driver turns his head, he turns his head back and forth in one eighteenth of a second, which is humanly impossible. The glint of the sunshine off the Vaseline hair of Roy Kellerman William Greer was a driver, Roy Kellerman was, uh, you call him, shotgun. Uh, that's been mistaken and misconstrued in, into a gun. Now, William Greer did draw his gun. He did draw his gun. I found that in, in the Alkins photo. But everything's been doctored. And until I got on the scene and started applying gestalt psychology and explaining how these optical illusions and delusions were created, Everyone believed that the Zapruder film was real. real. 
Now, last point about Kennedy. President Kennedy was a member of the Office of Naval Intelligence. In World War II, he manned the PT boat. The PT boat was really a spy vessel. It was a stealth spy vessel. And he was stationed on Guadalcanal. Lo and behold, I investigate Guadalcanal. And I found out that for over 100 years, the people of Guadalcanal had been plagued by lights that come out of the sea and fly into the mountains in northern Guadalcanal. They go from the mountains into the sea. And fishermen, who've been foolhardy enough to go there to investigate the dragonfish, this is what they called it, the dragonfish, wound up not coming back, disappearing, or coming back with severe burns that were inflicted upon them by the dragonfish. You know dragons breathe fire, so the Guadalcanal people labeled this UFO dragonfish. And it turns out that the Office of Naval Intelligence discovered there was a huge nest of undersea based UFOs. And that is one of the reasons that we conducted the nuclear atomic tests that we did on any Wetok Atoll and uh, Bikini Island so in a nutshell, I'm, I'm just wrapping this all up because uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, you, uh, excuse me, Mr. E Eastwood, you covered a lot of territory and I commend you uh, for all of that. Uh, with regard to the Skinwalker Walker Ranch, that creature has a, a name or a type. I have in my possession an MJ-12 briefing document dated 1989. And it lists four kinds of extraterrestrials with which the United States has had contact. Humanoid extraterrestrials who stand upright, have legs, arms, and heads like us. The greys, which are drones or slaves of the humanoids. They're used for piloting their spacecraft when they have to go into hibernation in long voyages. Non-humanoid entities, alien entities, they say, describe them as creatures from a world where evolution took a different evolutionary path. And the one I want to bring to your attention with regard to Skinwalker, they call them transmorphic entities. And these transmorphic entities are described as pure mind energy from another dimension that's curious about our universe and can come into this universe, Lars, uh, to explore it, and that they have the ability to channel their mind energy into matter and assume any form they wish to assume. So the transmogrification of this humanoid dressed in, I think you said, uh, 18th century clothes, then bending over and changing into a wolf, this is one of those transmorphic entities. Well, thank you, Robert. You're uh, welcome. I, I was just you know, I'm I'm talking about how the driver and the passenger were moving in perfect unison with each other, and yeah. and that's what my mother showed me when I was younger. Mm. She wanted yeah. me to lean forward and block the view of people on my side of the car from looking in, seeing her playing with her purse inside the car. So when she moved yeah. towards the front of the car, I'd be leaning forward. She'd be moving mm. back. I was moving in perfect unison, and. Yeah. The coincidence that the driver and the passenger are moving in perfect unison with each other, they're not dodging bullets because they're no, out no, of sequence no. with the bullets. Let me explain that. Let me explain that to you. The car came down Elm Street at 11.4 miles an hour, and they created an optical illusion that is moving at 35 miles an hour without having stopped twice. It stopped in front of the sign. It stopped at the grassy knoll. The forward movement, if you study that the section of the film, they're both thrown forward because that's the moment when Greer hit the brake and came to a screeching halt. And the momentum threw both of them forward as it did Governor Connolly and the passengers in the back seat. Another thing is between the time the car passed the sign, which is heavily edited, I mean, they, they admit that they lost four frames, they claim four frames. but. The fact is that Mr. Zapruder testified before the Warren Commission that he was filming the assassination and that when the car got behind the sign, 
he saw President head and shoulders pop up above the sign and then drop back down. The film is doctored there. They cut that out. Now, the reason the president bolted up is he got shot in the back between the shoulder blades. And this is uh, Secret Service testimony. They heard the president say, oh my God, I've been shot. And when he got hit in the back, he stood up and then he fell back down into the seat. The second point is the car crawled out from behind the sign. And so that's been doctored. Ten feet of film has been removed. Two lampposts have turned into one lamppost. And the easiest way that I can describe it to you is this way. Spread your five fingers out. Splay them out. And imagine you put scotch tape across your fingertips. But the scotch tape is not scotch tape. It's just to stick it there. It's the Zapruder film. Shot. Your thumb is shot number one. That's the shot behind the sign. Number two is the shot in the throat. Number three is the shot at Z295, which left the vapor trail, which I discovered, a condensation trail left in the, in the air that gl glanced off President Kennedy's head. It didn't go in, it just glanced off, ricocheted, and that bullet went into Governor Connolly. I don't have enough fingers, to be honest with you, because I'm at uh, my ring finger and my pinky finger. I should have another finger to ex describe to you what happened with the grassy No, Three shots arrived, triangulation of fire, and they blew President Kennedy's head off. The first shot came from the right front. It was a mercury sulfide explosive bullet. This was seen by the CIA agent in charge of scrutinizing this Zapruder film, he got to see the uncut film, and Douglas Horn did a Dino Brugioni, that was his name. He saw the top of President Kennedy's head explode and go vertically with a huge silver flash of light. This was the mercury explosive bullet. That's been cut out of the Zapruder film. The debris that went up into the air rained back down and hit the door and hit the trunk and splattered the people. That's been removed. So for those last three shots, imagine you've got a, a space, an interval of time between the arrival of shots. They snip the film between the first and second. They snip the film between the second and third. And they turn three shots into one inexplicable event. No okay. one and physics has been able to explain the movement of President Kennedy's body at that Z313 um, junction. Okay. So that's how the optical illusions are created. Okay, Rob. Yeah, go thank, ahead. You. thank you. And uh, uh, Mr. Eastwood, you have any comments on this? Uh, yeah, I, I do want to mention one thing that uh, happened and a uh, very fascinating uh uh, segment there. I appreciate that. Uh, I do want to mention one thing that happened at the Bethesda Naval Hospital, and this is a very knowledgeable group. You probably are familiar with it, but for, for the public and for the radio people. Um, and I think this is a key factor in understanding, you know, how, uh, how everything really works. Uh, this is a part of the story that not many people know. It involved one of my stepfather's close co-workers. The same night they brought Kennedy's body into Bethesda and I'll just tell you in two minutes what happened at 4.30 Eastern Time, November 22nd 63, three hours after Kennedy was shot down was Lieutenant Commander William Bruce Pitzer received a phone call at his home uh, he was the head of the audiovisual department of the Naval Medical School whereas my stepfather John Stringer was the Navy's chief photographer and he had a couple years of medical school and he did all the autopsies for um, autopsy photos and also the uh, x-ray photos. Anyway, anyway, we were getting back to his co-worker, Lieutenant Commander Pitzer. He was called to the autopsy of the president. And uh, there, of course, he would partner with my stepfather. Now, he took his own set of photos. He took a video of the autopsy. Now, what happened early the following week is a corpsman, Dennis David, stopped by Pitzer's office and found him editing film. It was a hand, he was hand-cranking a 16-millimeter black-and-white film. Uh, 
David watched the short movie. He, he saw the body of President Kennedy viewed from the waist up. Hands rolled the body back and forth. Pitzer reached a conclusion. He said the shot that killed Kennedy he had to have come from in the front because there was a small injury wound and a large back exit wound, as, as you just went over a few minutes ago. So this evidence directly contradicts the Warren report, which was, you know, obviously a classic disinformation document. But here's what here's what else happened. Here's the here's the end of the rest of the story. Uh, Bill Pitzer was shot to death on October 29, 1966. His body was discovered at 8 p.m. on the floor of the TV production studio of the National Naval Medical Center. Uh, about 4 p.m., the Navy ruled suicide, but his friends and widow disagreed. He had a strong personality. In fact, he'd been about to leave the military for a new career four days before. His, his uh, demise, Pitzer told a colleague he was ready to submit his retirement letter to the Navy. He had lucrative offers from ABC and CBS, and he thought, uh, I think the offers were connected with his assassination film. Joyce, his widow, said on the Saturday he was shot, Bill had gone to the office to write a speech uh, to deliver at a local junior college uh, where he was going to tell them about his future career and uh, how he was going to use the 35 millimeter slides and 16 millimeter film to uh, to uh, jumpstart his career. Anyway, strangely, Bill Pitzer's film of JFK's body was never found to date. The film vanished, and there was a ladder found next to his body. Right on the ceiling above the ladder was exactly the spot, according to his wife, where he kept hidden the JFK photo. That's a good story. Yes, indeed. Uh, if we have a couple of minutes. I wanted to say I, I've gone through you know, the testimony of John T. Stringer and Robert Knudsen, and it's very clear that your your stepfather, correct? Uh, John Stringer? Stringer was my yes. mother's side, uh, right? Okay. He was threatened because he gave an interview to David Lifton, and in that interview, early on, right after the assassination, he described everything that the Parkland doctors had uh, described word for word the huge exit wound in the back of the head, uh, the brain matter extruding. But by 1968, he changed his uh, he changed his testimony, and he also testified be before the Assassination Records Review Board. So it's clear to me that uh, Mr. Stringer learned the lesson that. Uh, People who talked about it died, like uh, Commander Pitzer. The uh, last thing about Commander Pitzer is they found a gun in his right hand, and he was a left-handed man. So a lot of people were assassinated in train with President Kennedy, and this was a deep state plot, and it's still going on today. The things that we are going through today are extensions of the JFK assassination. We got on the wrong track of history, and now... Some people are trying to get us back on the right track of history, and the, this disclosure is the first step in that direction. Okay, Ralph, no uh, we're, uh, we're into our yes, break here. All right, uh, you're listening to The Other Side of uh, Midnight. Uh, your hosts are Ken Thea and Keith Morgan, and we'll be right back after this short break.
theothersideofmidnight.com. Talk radio with pictures on demand. Liberate your hyperdimensional time scale and non linearly access over 400 hours of conversation at the cutting edge of science and thought. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive content that fits your interests and time schedule. Filter episodes by guest or subject. Membership costs $9.95 a month, $0.33 cents a day. Listen while you travel or as an environment to your endeavors. $0.08 cents an episode. Two and a half cents per hour of content. The other side of midnight.com. Welcome back to the other side of midnight and we have been having a great conversation uh, talking about UFOs and the JFK assassination which is what we are into right now. Uh, I'm going to ask my guests, um, uh, I'm going to ask Gerald uh, what his take is on the UFO and assassination conspiracy part of it. Uh, because Kennedy was probably briefed on all of this stuff at some point. Um, now, whether or not uh, he was shot because of it or whether there was something else going on, it's so murky now. Everybody's got different uh, ideas and concepts about what actually took place in it. But what, what do you think really took place? Well, I think there, as we we have surmised, there was a secret cabal, which was comprised of certain uh, black ops elements of the CIA, uh, and I think also you had some very top uh, people in Dallas, possibly some Texas oilmen, possibly uh, some people in New Orleans, uh, possibly uh, Operation Mongoose. I think they all worked together. And I think it was a, um, I think there were multiple reasons that he had to go because the, uh, the, uh, the CFR people, the trilateral people and so forth, they could not control him. He never would become a member, none of the Kennedys would. So you'd have 24 years of Kennedys and the, the New World Order group, which, you know, George H.W. spoke of, would not be able to take over the country as early as they did. So. I think he just had to go for multiple and a variety of reasons. And um, and I think when he said that he was going to splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces and start cooperating with uh, Khrushchev on space and UFOs and then make disclosure, I think that was uh, I think that was the final the final uh, episode. That was it. OK. Um. Did you have any questions for Robert? Because uh, uh, he's going to probably tap the scoot here in a little bit. Oh, good. Yeah, I do have one question for Robert, and I've really sure. enjoyed uh, your uh, your briefing. What, what is your opinion? This we have not discussed this yet. Uh, do you? Are, I'm sure you're familiar with the Admiral Wilson documents. Uh, uh, Thomas and, Wilson. Yes. Uh, okay, Thomas Wilson. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think they're real? Yes, I do. I really trust uh, Richard Dolan's uh, investigation, his research, and I believe Richard Dolan um, as much as I believe you. 
because uh, I know him very well for many years, and he would never make up a story such as uh, the, the detailed conversation that he had with, uh, with Thomas Wilson. The Navy's been trying to tell the people the truth about UFOs since inception. And it's been an internecine war in the military between the Navy, or among the Navy, and the Army Air Force. I say it that way because they really have one mentality. They were one unit until 1947 when they were split. Uh, I would like to mention with regard to the photography that your stepfather, when he testified before the Assassination Records Review Board and they showed him the pictures, he said, those are not the pictures I took. They, right. they're, they're not framed the way I framed them. And that's not the kind of, <laughs> that's not the type of film that, that I used. And the reason for this whole thing, I just want to sum it up. The reason is they got away with the JFK assassination by killing someone who was like a, a fraternal twin in appearance. That was Officer Tippett. Officer Tippett bore such a close resemblance to President Kennedy that they used to rib him on the, uh, on the uh, Dallas Police Department and call him Jack and JFK. Jack Ruby said he shot Oswald because he killed a, a good man like President Kennedy. If you understand that President Kennedy, Jack, and JFK were nicknames they gave to Tippett, it explains the whole thing. So the back of the head shot, where you see the hand holding up the head, that's Tippett's head. The profile shot, the body in the morgue, I call him the Bethesda victim. That's Officer Tippett. And I've proven that beyond the shadow of a doubt. The moles on the neck, the, the little break in the nose, the nose is different. But they had uh, the Michelangelo of morticians work on him to dress him up, shave his eyebrows, shave him up, plaster the wound. And that's the real deal. Didn't Jackie President make a comment about that doesn't look like... Yes, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up in William Manchester's book. They were having a debate over whether to have an off open casket in the rotunda or not to have an open casket. And so they talked to Walt Brown, Arthur Schlesinger, Jackie Kennedy, and Robert Kennedy conferred. And uh, Arthur Schlesinger said, you know, when you look at it from a distance, it looks like him. But when you get close, it doesn't look like him at all. And then Robert Kennedy, it says it looked like Jack, but it's, it's not Jack. And Mrs. Kennedy said, that's not Jack. That looks like something out of Madame Tussauds Wax Museum. You can find that in Death of a President by William Manchester. And I'll remind you, William Manchester wrote a very, very detailed and historically accurate book. And then he was sued. Johnson protested, Jackie protested, he was sued, and if you read the book, you get the impression that he was ma made to rewrite it. The impression I got was that he took a thousand pages and then he cut them all up into individual pieces, then he glued them all back together. And the way to go through William Manchester's book is with a yellow marker. And, and for me, anytime it said Tippett, yellow marker, yellow marker, yellow marker. And he was trying to tell people the truth. So is but, Tippett buried at uh, Arlington? That's why I've never been to Washington. I've never been to Arlington. And I'll tell you one more thing. I sent this information to John F. Kennedy Jr. He passed away on July 16th, which was three, three days ago. I sent this information in all detail with all, of, all the photographs. And I said to him, don't be afraid of those photographs. They are not your father. They are a man who was involved in the plot, and he did not live to see sunset on November 22nd, 1963. It's very, it's, it's very, very deep, deep stuff uh, for me. I'm very intimately involved. A lot of this is revelation, I'm telling you. Which son, A lot did, of this, which son did you send this letter to? The only son, John F. Kennedy Jr. And it was after that letter that he came out with George Magazine 
and uh, began to expose it. He was planning to why do you, you know people think he named it George after George Washington? It was a double dig. He was saying George for George H. W. Bush. We have pictures of George H. W. Bush, E. Howard Hunt, and several other uh, CIA agents who were there in Dealey Plaza watching and orchestrating this global theatrics. So and how many this, years ago did you send this? Oh, that was, oh, here, here's, I'm glad you reminded me. This would have been around 1994 that I sent, it was hand-delivered, hand-delivered to uh, Jackie and, Robert, uh, and John F. Kennedy Jr. Now, let me tell you this. I have never been to Washington to visit the grave because I don't believe President Kennedy's body is there. And I wrote this to John F. Kennedy Jr. When Jackie was buried and her body was interred at Arlington, if you look at the videotape, you will see John F. Kennedy go down to the grave of Jackie. He kneels down, makes the sign of the cross, and he steps up, starts walking away. As he walked away, he turned toward the eternal flame and where President Kennedy's body is supposed to be, and I thought that he was going to kneel there. And I started yelling, screaming at the television, don't do it, don't do it. I mean, it's really very emotional for me. And he went over there, he almost genuflected, and then he thought of it, he kissed his hand, and he tapped, he tapped the stone, and he walked away. Those are facts, and you can verify that by looking at the video tape. And I was very gratified, because I think that would have been a total desecration. All right. this, out. this is what has to be known. This is what has to be known. Yeah, Robert, we're coming up. Uh, this is the last uh, half hour. Yes, I'm going to bail out right now, but thank you. And I would like uh, to have Mr. Eastwood's contact information so I can share all of this, uh, my documents with him. I'm sure he will appreciate them. Okay. Please, uh, show him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so Gerald, is there... Um, what is the um, major? Um, where are the major UFO and um, incidences that really stick out in your in your mind? That I know, like Barney and Betty Hill and the Roswell and uh, things like that. Uh, pretty much, are, you know, they are history. But is there anything else that you think most people don't know about that should know about in the UFO field? Well, let me think. Uh, of course, Travis Walton is is fascinating. You've probably covered that on prior programs. Uh, Betty and Barney Hill, very, very interesting. Um, the uh, There's a lot of unusual encounters that are, are quite bizarre down in South America that many people don't know too much about. I could chat about one or two of those. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's. I could also talk a little bit about the Pentagon kill shot scenario. That's remote viewing. It's another one of their remote viewing programs. Now, they haven't had any disasters there. And in fact, I don't think the program currently exists, but Major Ed Dames uh, feels that we are approaching what he would call the end. Uh, he's not sure whether an asteroid's going to hit the ocean or what. But uh, it's all in my book, so it's it's interesting. Not the end of the world, but the the end of uh, uh, you know if if, if a they, NASA could find a, uh, an asteroid up to about one kilometer or close to it, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, one kilometer and above, one kilometer and below, it has difficulty. At that level, it can destroy a, a major state, but it cannot destroy the world. But uh, anyway, the, the Pentagon kill shot scenarios uh, covered pretty much in my book. That's that's a topic unto itself. Um, well, Gerald, can, can you just say a little bit more about that when you're talking about remote viewing? Are they... Are they viewing these craft? What, what are they viewing and why is it called the kill shot? Oh, okay. Let me let me talk about that for just a moment. I guess we have five or ten minutes. So yeah, that'd be a good way to end it possibly. Not too many people cover this. 
Major Ed Dames was part of a CIA and a jointly sponsored project uh, involving remote viewing. He stated this project saw the end of days. Now, again, I, I think the world's going to continue for, you know, forever. But uh, the, the end of days just means, uh, I don't know what he means by that. But uh, he says it's being tied to a series of major solar flares over a one-year period where Earth was unprepared. Uh, in a recent interview, he was asked whether an asteroid such as Wormwood may have been the cause of the solar activity and the flares. He wasn't certain. He implied it was possible. Uh, what Again, what they do is they uh, remote viewing is used for a number of uh, scenarios, and I don't know exactly how it works, but it's... Uh, it's an it's a, a scientific experiment, uh, and it revolves parapsychology. The military knows about it. A lot of researchers know about it. Uh, anyway, Major Dames has this kill shot theory, and I think it also could be based on a large object passing between the Earth and the Sun uh, that might create some EMP effects. Um, but here's what he says in his web website. During the top secret remote viewing CIA and U.S. Army research program, trained viewers, that's it, trained viewers, that were normally tasked with foreseeing the outcome of war-related events began picking up on a future occurrence that appeared to mark a dramatic shift in global life. At first, these viewers, along with Major Ed Dames, the program's senior operations and training officer, had feared that they were looking at a future nuclear war. But this was not so. It turns out, after years of remote viewing sessions, the event is in fact a series of possible solar flares that are very devastating to the Earth and may cause billions of dollars of damage uh, to our uh, electrical grids. Uh, now, normally you may not take such a warning seriously, but the remote viewers did have a good, pretty good track record. They, uh, the disaster in Japan, uh, a mysterious crop fungus, a 9.0 earthquake. They've they predicted a lot of these things before. And here's, I'll, I'll just read about six bullet points of what he says that kind of synopsize his current views. He's retired. He does seminars, I think, at this point. He's stating that Russia has restarted their remote viewing program. Uh, he says Russia and China are about to replace the petrodollar. Uh, he says, uh, stay away from large cities. Uh, he believes the western Pacific coast is going to have problems. Uh, he said, avoid earthquake zones. He said, multiple solar flares may damage the grid. Uh, he's concerned about nuclear power plants in the U.S. Northeast. Um, and he just says, you know, education and reading. There's no end to education. So uh, I, I don't know. I say a lot about it. Actually, I, about 10 pages of the 170 pages of my book are on this topic. But it's, it's too detailed to go into right this very second. But that's what it's all about. And it's very interesting. And it's, you know, education and preparation and, and strategic so, planning. So it's not, it's not specifically about UFOs. It's about a, foreseeing some possible disaster. That, are, that may occur to the earth yes right. but, well we yeah. also live in a time where a parallel universe is, is becoming more and more a plausibility so you know it may or may not be right <laughs> yeah yeah the only reason well one reason i mentioned it is that apparently in that project that went wrong uh wherever or whoever it was and, and maybe it was a U.S. project, maybe it was, who knows, but uh, the one that uh, Nick Redfern wrote about and uh, Dr. Ray uh, was consulted on, that was uh, some kind of remote viewing. I wouldn't call it really remote viewing, but um, uh, it was parapsychological research, and it went really wrong. Now, his program, Major Dames, nothing ever went wrong there. In fact, they, they picked up a lot of, uh, of uh, positives that they actually... Uh, decided and, and determined we're, we're probably going to happen. So uh, a lot of stuff like this goes on. And, and I'm I just, surprised there hasn't been a mention of UFOs in the remote viewing. That's right. He never, he doesn't touch on that topic at all. He doesn't touch that's on strange. it. strange. Um, so uh, I don't know why. But uh, as you say about UFOs, we're, we're not being told uh, a lot. Very little is released. Uh, so the public has to do its own research and critical thinking. Thus, my book, 
Uh, on a greater scale, Ed James and his team have tapped into the fantastic, the possible future of the Earth. It might be of interest, uh, you know, because because we talk a lot about space, time, and dimensions. So I just added it as to add one more flavor to the book. But, um, you know, I have no idea exactly what they saw. And at this point, he has three or four theories. He's not 100% certain what's happening either. Well, okay, so... I want to come back to this idea of the uh, UFOs being possibly interdimensional because I find that very um, actually more more convincing to me because of the way people that are having experiences, even Keith, you your experience, it doesn't seem like it's totally of the physical. Are you getting any reports around that? I mean, like, is there a bleed through of realities? Uh, for me, okay. Well, you know, uh, are we dealing with another dimension? Well, if they can materialize and disappear at will and merge, I think that might be a sign that we might be dealing with a, a separate dimension. Um, I don't think we have enough information yet, but um, I would say that it's almost as if we're viewing a three-dimensional hologram, but one which has mass. There was a series of uh, sightings in Italy called the Urzi sightings. I think it's U-R-Z-I. He's an individual, and he lived at just an average guy, and he lives in this, uh, I, I think he lives in Milan now, but he lived somewhere else before. And he had a number of, uh, he, he took some incredible videos. I mean, dozens and dozens of incredible videos, daytime and nighttime of ufos and then he moved and he thought well i'll never see them again and when he moved to the city he had a window at the top of his house and he said one night he just thought i'm just going to open the window and look outside for a while and he said in about 20 minutes there was an amazing light show out there and he said this continued and he took another another 15 to 20 videos they followed him so uh i don't know what's going on but uh I think the problem can't be solved quite yet. It's very possible they are intradimensional uh, because that would explain almost everything. In fact, there was one uh, case in Britain that seemed to indicate that. It was called the Marconi Object. That was a British defense industrial company. They, they did top secret high risk projects. They're in Frimley, England. They had a company headquarters, a testing zone there. Anyway, a security guard in 76 was at night patrol. And uh, th this facility housed top secret info on Britain's nuclear sonar, infrared, I think ballistic capabilities. Anyway, he was walking down a corridor. He noticed a blue light emanating from underneath one of the doors. He opened the door and in a corner over an open filing cabinet, shuffling through piles of top secret documents, he saw what he described as an extraterrestrial being. He said it was humanoid. Uh, it had a light light uniform with a blue glow it turned towards the guard and in a blue haze it just disappeared mm. so that's odd the guard reported immediately the complex went into lockdown the next morning the guard was under military medical and psychiatric care and he never returned so uh, th th this this seems to indicate a dimensional aspect right well one thing i've also noticed is there's two ufo researchers i know one is uh, bruce cornett and the other is wilbur allen and both of them have filmed UFOs and they seem to have a telepathic connection with them. So like they'll get the message. I mean, like Bruce used to talk about it. And he, this was before there was digital cameras and he would get the message to take his camera and he'd go out and he'd start taking photos. And if he ran out of film, the, the craft would just hover and stop. Well, he changed his film, and when his film was ready, they would continue. And he he took some amazing, amazing uh, shots of formations. And the same with Wilbur Allen. He he seems to have this telepathic connection. So it makes me really um, consider this. It's more than psychological. It's this uh, inter interspecies telecommunication kind of experience where I, I think that they really are wanting us to know about them otherwise why would they make themselves visible to these two researchers these two photographers like they're doing a light show I mean it was 
amazing the photos that Bruce would come up and the same with Wilbur. Yeah, exactly. I uh, I totally agree with you. I think there's uh, I think there's an element that something is sterile is the Pentagon UFO report, 13 page document that it doesn't consider. It doesn't consider all the all the uh, facets of the of the diamond that we're looking at it, it's a very narrow report and uh i think I, it's I, an I, insult frankly yeah it's, it's it's unbelievable it's a whitewash i think yeah it, it's uh now it's not the fault of Louis elizondo he's a smart sharp guy but he, his scope was limited by by mandate and uh, and the real report is being uh, shielded from us again they will not release it so But I appreciate the opportunity to have uh, talked to everybody tonight and around the world and uh, talked to you, your people as well. And uh, if Richard is uh, listening, uh, 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 thank you very much for the, uh, the exposure and time tonight. Well, thank you. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about your podcast? I know you have a when is it on? How often is it on? Oh, okay. It's, uh, it's not a fixed schedule, but basically if you go on Audible, or any of the major podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and just enter Gerald Eastwood, the Pentagon UFO Report, then uh, you can just subscribe or listen. It's streaming, of course, to the latest episodes, and and there's there's a, a block of inventory in there. And uh, there, the webpage also describes a little bit about me and about my book, Beyond the Pentagon UFO Report, which is an e-book and printed book on Amazon as we speak. Uh, that's where 75% of the books are sold nowadays, and uh, that's where my books are, and uh, that's that's the deal. So I understand that you have, uh, what is it, three fiction books that are under a pen name? Oh, I do have three books. Right. Actually, they're nonfiction. Actually, oh, they're, they're nonfiction. nonfiction. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they're nonfiction, but it's I made mean, almost, the talk about the deep state almost sounds like fiction, but uh, one is called, uh, yeah, I wrote those on just to protect myself one more layer because I thought those books could upset certain people in certain places. I, I wrote under a pen name, uh, my mother's father's name, Muir Taylor. Anyway, that's the pen name, and the, na- the first name of the book is Surviving the Deep State, and that talks about all of the different elements of the deep state. Uh, everything. It covers everything. Uh, and then there's two other books. Uh, you must have silver. That's economic preparation. I'm talking about the metal silver. It's an economic strategic preparation book. And the third book is called Iran, the event. Uh, that is a potential occurrence, obviously, uh, in the near future where we may go to war in the Middle East against those people and what we can do to protect ourselves and what that, that war might be like and how it may affect us um, from a standpoint of, uh, you know, operational security and strategic relocation and those sort of things. So those are my books, Surviving the Deep State. Well, thank you so much. We are at the end of the show here. We've been having a lively discussion with uh, Gerald Eastwood and Robert Morningstar joined us. And we look forward to hearing more about what you're doing and tune in to his Pentagon Report podcast for the latest update. And this is The Other Side of Midnight. And co-hosting are Keith Morgan and myself, Cynthia. Good night, all. Mm-hmm.